All right. Okay, it was great to be here in Texas. So uh, we were all really expecting how Australian speak, so good day. Good day, you all. Howdy. talks about uh, hiding the open. Hiding the open is really camouflage. It's the way that uh, paints and colours are used, not only with warships, but other things too, although I'm talking most of warships. Our colours used to hide objects that sometimes can be right out in the open, but you want it to be hidden, or you want someone to be not sure what it is. Now, the human eye accepts colour through brightness or dull. And when you look at an object, if it's against this young lady, pretty young lady here has got a dark top against a dark object, and you're looking at her in the shadow, so consequently, the two dark objects tend to merge together in, in colour. But if she was to step out in the sun, and that nice shiny blue top was to catch the light, it would stand out as a brighter blue, and you'd easily be able to pick it out from the paint of the colour. So, um, there are certain colours within reality that are special. There's red. We've got a gentleman there in red, but it stands out. You can see him everywhere. It also means morning. And since he's wearing a kilt, it's probably just believe that he's got red on. <laughs> There's green. Green, my wife's wearing. That's the cooling colour. I'm wearing green. That's supposed to be a colour that says that's okay. Yellow is a colour that means warmth. Here in Houston, from what I've seen in the way Andy drives, it also means go faster. <laughs> uh, very fast. So, um, for some people, colour blindness means that a bright light, such as a bright white light or a bright blue light, will be the thing that you need in order to, to spot danger. So that's why police cars will often have a combination of red lights, blue lights, white lights. That's trying to catch the spectrum that everybody understands and you can see that light. So against a, um, a bright background, a white object will reflect a similar amount of light as a, um, the horizon. The horizon is nearly always white. If you look out across there, the horizon is a white colour. And so if you have a white ship, as we saw yesterday uh, in Galveston uh, Bay, we saw ships with white and the ships in dark and, and with red. And as I pointed out to Andy and the others, you can see the red ships really easy. The, the ships with white was very hard to pick them out. So the human eye can distinguish between these objects, but um, dull white and bright white can be used. If you've got an object on the horizon that's painted in, say, bright white, but it's got areas of the ship that are in shade, technically speaking, and in reality, you can see the areas in shade quite easily. So in warship painting, what they do is they paint the external sections of the ship in a very flat white, but the areas in shade are painted in the glossiest, brightest white they can get. Glossy white reflects light, dull white reflects light, but at a distance, shade and, and um, brightness come into effect, and so it all just looks white. So that's, that's covered that. The Padiki effect is what it's called. The Padiki effect is where an object that's going away from you is cooling down and therefore appears blue. An object coming towards you when you're looking at the stars appears red if it's coming towards you, you can see the speed. Now camouflage actually starts a lot longer ago than people think. The Romans were the first people to actually adopt camouflage. It may seem strange, but they did. The reason was quite simple. The Romans had to catch pirates. There was a lot of pirates all over the Mediterranean. But they also fought other fleets. When you fight, um, of course, with a oared rowing ship, um, you're depending entirely on the, the ability of the guys to keep rowing and keep that ship going. So the, the scout ships they used were fairly small, but they were very fast. But there was a problem with that. If they sighted an enemy ship, and it was a lot bigger than them, the enemy ship could follow them, and by using half its rowers at a time, rest half, row with the other half, they could eventually wear that small ship out. So the Romans caught on to the idea that if they painted the small ship blue, pale blue, and they gave it masts that were very pale blue as well, and a sail that was either white or very pale blue, it blended in with the horizon. The result was that the board ship could come in close, it could see what it needed to see. If it was a pirate ship, it could possibly even get close enough to then chase it and catch it. But if it was an enemy fleet, they could, they could turn and move away. If the enemy fleet hadn't seen them, then of course the advantage was that although the ships had more oars, 
big battleships, they still couldn't chase them because they didn't throw them in the first place. And so the Romans were the first ones to realise the value of camouflage. The camouflage dropped out of fashion. The reason, of course, being that as time grew on, ships got bigger and bigger masts, they had more sails, and they just became almost impossible to hide. You can't hide an object that's easy to see. So nobody bothered. In fact, we got to the stage where, by the time of the Napoleonic Wars, it was more important to be sure a ship was on your side than it was to be sure that you could see it. It was important to know it was yours. So if our pretty lady here could help us, you get this sort of thing happening. In order to tell one fleet from another, they've got lots of gunpowder going off, they've got cannons roaring, and in the smoke, you can't tell one ship from another. So Nelson hit on the idea of painting his ships black with yellow stripes, and with the gun ports that also allowed for a checkerboard effect. So the result was that when you saw the ships, you'd say, yes, that's British, don't shoot of it. If it's American, uh, it's black and white. If it's French, it could be uh, usually black green or black yellow, black brown, but not exactly the same. And so on through the different nationalities. Some of the Spanish ships, for example, were red. So that was the way they went. But then what happened, of course, we had the gunpowder revolution. When the gunpowder revolution came about, all of a sudden, ships could see further. Now they still wanted to paint them in dust. They still wanted to be able to see their ships because they believed that it was, it was necessary to tell one fleet from another. And so they, you can see their USS Olympia, and she's adopted a white hull, red waterline, buff ground upworks, prominent black cows and funnels. Then they can look at that and they say, yeah, okay, that's American. We don't shoot at that one. But it doesn't hide the ship. It, it makes it visible, but it, it identifies. Now what happened was that uh, as the, the period wore on through the, the age of steam, guns were increasing in range, increasing in range, and gunnery officers suddenly started to think, hey, some ships are harder to see than others, and the ones that are harder to see are harder to range on. And if they're harder to range on, they're harder to hit. So perhaps we should go for colours that are hard to see. The first fleet to ever use grey in war was in fact the American fleet. And of course that was the uh, Admiral Dewey's fleet that went into Manila Bay. Orders had been given prior, around about three or four years before the Spanish-American War, that in the event of war, the ships would have been in grey. And of course Dewey's squadron was in China, and so the all he had was black and white and various others, so he mixed it up and he made it grey. It was a very unofficial shade of grey, but nonetheless grey. They steamed into Manila Harbour, and I hate to say this to you American audience, but with some of the most remarkably inaccurate gunfire in the whole of naval history, they managed to sink the Spanish, who had even more inaccurate gunfire. And the reason being that the American fleet standing on the horizon in pale grey was very hard to see. The Spanish fleet was painted white, and they stood out against the green background. So the Americans, despite their appalling gunnery, were able to shoot them up. Now, in their defence, I have to admit, but the reason why uh, Dewey's fleet was so bad at Gunnery was purely because they, they were in China, they didn't have much ammunition to spare, and therefore very little time to practice. When war broke out, they received orders from Washington to proceed straight to Manila Bay and beat the hell out of the Spanish. So who had time to practice? The best they could do was go down and do the best they did. And so with a, an average of hits that was around about one half that of what the Chinese had achieved against the Japanese five years before and lost, the Americans succeeded in winning. And the reason they won was because they were hard to see. Okay. So the next step was the ships went to the pale grey. Pale grey was considered an excellent way to hide a ship. Against a, a cloudy background, and at the sea a lot of the backgrounds are clear, they're very cloudy, but the pale ship blends in. And so that became the standard. When World War I was approaching, the British wanted to look different than the rest. Sorry, first of all, let's, let's just discuss something here with the, with the Russo-Japanese War. The Russo-Japanese War, of course, followed on just after the Spanish-American War. The Japanese fleet that sailed off out to, to fight the Russians was observed by an American observer living in, in 
uh, Japan, and he said it's dull, it's boring, it's hard to see, and it's not even clean. But what he didn't understand was that Admiral Togo, the Japanese commander, had said, what's most important is whether you hit the enemy or not. It doesn't matter how pretty your ship looks. It doesn't matter if the ship's smart and got nice brass. If the ship can't hit the enemy, there's no good fighting. So Togo, in the months before the battle, just hold it together. In the months before the battle, had all the Japanese fleet painted out in his description. That meant that all the brass work, anything like this, would be painted grey. The crew were discouraged from cleaning up any of the, the spots on the ship that got dirty. Let it get grubby. Let it get blend into the background. So he sailed off to war, and when he did, the Russian commander came to meet him. Sorry, one, sorry. There we go. The Russian commander came to meet him. The Russian commander had also been influenced by the idea to have his ships hard to sea, but he was also mixed up. He decided that not only did his ships have to be hard to see, he also had to know that they were his. So he painted them black. Black wasn't too bad considering the weather conditions, but then because he wasn't sure that he wanted to be able to sure see his ships from the Japanese ships, he gave bright red yellow funnels. Consequently, the Japanese fleet, which was very hard to see, could see the Russian fleet as easily as any of those great yellow funnels standing up meant the enemy. So the Japanese, with an incredible accuracy of gunnery, managed to sink pretty much the entire Russian fleet at the Battle of Tsushima. Now, everyone learned, thank you, we can take that down there. Everybody learned from that, and a lot of people paid attention, and they said, hey, this is uh, pretty important, so we need to make sure that our ships are hard to see. So we went to this. This is another American battleship. And the Americans said, okay, if the, if the Japanese can win battles by having their ships look very plain and, and ordinary, we can do the same. So the American fleet adopted a very dull grey colour. She was almost black. Now, as World War One and uh, the, some of the fleets, however, and there's the Chinese, decided that they preferred their ships again to be like the Russians, easy to see. So although they adopted black, they still used white and yellow. Just before World War One, that fell out of fashion, and navies went across to plain grey. Got here. It's not pretty, it's not pretty at all, but if it can be, if it's hard to see, then it can fight, and that's the most important issue. So I'm just going to refer back to my notes for a second. Um, the German fleet entered World War I with their own idea. Their idea was that they would have their fleet done up in a certain way that it was a contrast of colours. The German ship here doesn't necessarily look at them in the illustration, but they started out with one shade of grey at the waterline, and as they got higher up the ship, they went to a lighter and lighter and lighter grey until the, they got up to here. The reason the masts were black was purely because they were using coal, and if they painted them white, they went black anyway. So it was considered the best thing to do was to paint it black in the first place. But that German ship is pretty much in the way the Germans saw the entry of World War I. However, you'll notice an unusual thing there. The funnel's red. The aft funnel. The reason for that was the Germans decided too, just like the Russians, you didn't need to know whose were whose. And in the coal smoke of the North Sea, it was going to be hard to tell one ship from another. As the German fleet sorting on every operation it went on, Orders were issued to the ships after they left sight of land, not before, but after they left sight of land. What they were to do was to paint the aft funnel on every ship. So if you had four funnels, it was the fourth funnel. If you had two, it was the second funnel, so forth. But that colour would be red for one operation, blue for another, yellow, green, etc. And in this instance, the Battle of Jutland, red was the colour, and so all German ships that fought the Battle of Jutland had their aft funnel painted red. This is the sort of thing that, that's important to people like the silver artists because when we, we're asked to do an artwork, 
if we paint it grey like a lot of people do and didn't research it, there's always someone out there that will say, hey, but hang on, wait, 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 that's wrong. It should have a red one or a yellow one or green or whatever. So in doing a painting such as I've done for the Texas here, it was really important to do a lot of research and a lot of people helped. Thank them an awful lot through them, a lot of people helped. The idea was to get the ship exactly as it looked at the time. And that's, that's a good an illustration there of where a lot of war games get it wrong. They'll fight the Butler Jutland and they'll have a grey funnel and just don't realise that that was an important part of the whole thing. Now, there was a gentleman called Arthur Thayer. Arthur Thayer was an American and he was an artist. Thayer's idea was that um, the best way to make it hard to shoot at another ship with gunnery was to make it so hard to see that you couldn't see it until you got really close. Most people said, look, that's not possible. A battleship like this is huge. How on earth are you going to do that? But Thayer went out and he looked at nature and he saw how different animals blended in with their backgrounds. Thayer heard one of the British artists say it can't be done and the reason he gave was that a tiger is yellow with black stripes. When the tiger's laying in the grass, you can't see it. When the tiger gets up and moves, the yellow and black stripes make it very obvious and you can see the tiger straight away. So the British artist said, this is impossible. As soon as that ship moves, you'll see it. So Slayer said, okay, but the reason you can see the tiger is because black and yellow are completely contrasting. What if I made the colours so close together that the eye would find it hard to pick them apart? So Thayer started to research a system where a shade of colour would go very gradually from blue to pale blue, look to be blue to pale blue to very light blue and so forth. And then he would combine them on the ship in different ways to hide different things. The result was that with the Thayer system, you could see a ship, or well, the ship could be a long distance away, and you might not even see it at all against the horizon. If it came close, there was nothing you could do. They were going to see it. But they are reasoned that if you see a ship five miles away, then okay, you can shoot and try and catch it. But if that same ship was ten miles away and you didn't even see it at all, you never knew it was there. And so you're at a disadvantage and that ship is at a, it's going to advantage. The trouble was, America, America wasn't at war at that time. And so Thayer's ideas were rejected by the British Admiralty at that particular period of time, 1915. And they said, no, 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 we don't like that. So they went to a British artist called Wilkinson. Wilkinson said, yes, I, I agree with the first assessment, you can't hide that ship. If you can't hide that ship, then what we've got to do is we're going to make sure that that ship is so damn hard to, to tell it what it is. That, um, thank you. And at this point, I've got to give a health warning here. If anyone gets confused or uh, dizzy or whatever, don't look. But this was the sort of thing that we came up with. And that's again, that's an American battleship painted to the Wilkinson British system. And the idea there was that when you looked at that ship, if you were in a submarine, you are looking, and there's a British version of it. If you're in a submarine, you get approximately four seconds to look at the object. So just think to yourself, to close your eyes, just think to yourself, one, two, and then open your eyes, cap, one, two, three, four, gone. Okay, and in that time, you've got to assess what ship it is, how big it is, what its course is, and therefore, give the math of where the torpedo's going to arrive when that ship arrives there. So if you can't tell, if you're looking at something like our first one there, wherever it went, got here somewhere, if you're looking at that, and you've got four second glances each time, and you're trying to work out how big it is, where it's heading, is it going that way, is it going this way, how fast is it going, you're at a dead loss. And so there was no attempt to hide in the open. It was merely an attempt to confuse in the open. Everyone would look at that and think, oh my gosh, what on earth is that? <laughs> and remember, we're looking down on it, so we're seeing the easy view. To show you that it's the easy view, Got some others here. This one is a waterline view. Again, our health warning if you get confused in colour, watch out. Which way is it going? How fast is it going? Where is it going to be when the torpedo arrives? That's very, very hard to tell. And if you've got four seconds to look at it, which we'll do, 
we shall say, okay, everybody look. One, and two, and three, and four, down. Now you've got to pass the mass to your officer and say, the bearing, the speed, okay, another four seconds. One, and two, and three, and four. Okay, how fast is it going? One, and two, and three, and four, what course is it on? Okay guys, fire the torpedo, lost. Uh, lost where, sir? I don't know. And to give you another idea, this is a famous painting. This was a famous painting of some ships in a dockyard being cleaned. You can see the cleaning at the bottom there. The main reason you can see it is because of the red. The red gives the ship away. But there's the, the ship, and in the background, there are some others. And from those stripes and, and confusion lines, you're supposed to work out if you're a submarine commander, where is that torpedo going to arrive? Now, the Germans claimed at the end of World War I, okay, they claimed at the end of World War I that the paint schemes used by the British had no effect whatsoever. No, 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 no effect. It was useless, waste of time, didn't work, shouldn't have done it. Well, it's interesting because for a Navy that claimed that this sort of camouflage scheme was pointless and didn't work, when World War II broke out, the German Navy became the most heavily camouflaged Navy in the world. Its ships had the most elaborate camouflages of World War II. So therefore I think we can probably say that their assessment of World War I was probably a little bit wrong. That uh, it was hard. Now the hardest thing of all to hide is an aircraft carrier. The reason being, of course, that the aircraft carrier is so distinctive in shape. This one here is the HMS Argus. And what I've got to tell you is that although you're seeing a black and white of it, the colours involved here are actually black, blue, green, yellow and white. There's even some red bits. And the red bits, the idea of that, by having a red section here, is because that attracts your eye. Just as we look around here, someone of a bright colour, your eyes attracted to that, you don't see that person so closely, you see that person first. So that's one of the reasons why they saw the colours are used. Now just to uh, finish a little bit on World War I, by the right page yet. Excuse me a bit. My drawings are so uh, all over the place, but unfortunately, one thing I forgot about with trouble was that uh, they would all roll up. And when they all rolled up, they would of course all get very hard to see. Some rolled up, and I think they're going to have to leave up tomorrow. But anyway, the, what, the drawing I was looking for, which I'll try and find, is a picture of HBS Fearless. HBS Fearless was an experimental camouflage for the end of World War I. The colour is described as pale seasick. <laughs> With, on top of pale seasick is dark seasick. On the stern of the ship are purple stripes. On the bow of the ship are uh, what they described as illness yellow. <laughs> These are very pale colours but the colour on the stern is dark. One funnel is painted bright red. One funnel is painted pale blue. One funnel is painted black. Another funnel is painted white. German submariner looking at that, first of all, it's mostly the same colour as the ocean. It's pale green. He's looking at that, he's trying to focus. He's looking at the other guys saying, what, per commandant, what is the bearing? What are the bearings? And he's like, oh no, I was sick. It looks awful. <laughs> the result was that, of course, when this arrived in the fleet, the officers who had served in the pre-war British Navy said, but what about our lovely polish? What about our lovely decks? What about our lovely brass? You're painting over everything. It's awful. The men loved it. They didn't have to clean the decks. They didn't have to polish the brass. But not only that, they felt protected. And that was one of the main reasons why, in World War I, the British Navy stayed with camouflage. They weren't sure it worked either. They were really unsure, does this work, doesn't it work? And one thing they did know was that the crews 
of the ships who were painted in those camouflage schemes felt that something was being done. They felt that some effort was being taken to protect them. And so it made them feel better. So for the reason of that alone, the British Admiralty said, well, whether or not it works, we'll find out in years to come. But the fact is that at the time, the men feel good with it, they feel safe, and so we're going to leave them. And lastly, just covering the end of World War I, one of the most significant things about the camouflage schemes we could have shown you there, particularly some of these confusion schemes, was that the reports coming back ashore from the men at sea were that ships sailing in company with ships painted in this were finding it hard themselves to tell what direction they were steaming, what speed, and they were on the surface. And sometimes they were sailing alongside that ship for days on end. And they were still finding it confusing. And they'd look at it and they'd say, Hey, has he changed course? I don't know. Has he? I think he could have. No, he hasn't. Yes, he has. No, he hasn't. What range is he now? I think he's a mile away. No, he's only done a half a mile. My God, he's coming straight at us. And this were the sort of reports they got back. And because of that, they concluded that regardless of what the German prisoners were saying, oh, no, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, they were satisfied that the reports of their own eyes, the reports of their own men at sea, were such that it definitely did work. So thank you very much. That's the World War One section, and tomorrow we'll cover the the, uh, the schemes which are described as hiding in the open, because in World War Two they did in fact find ways to pretty much hide in the open uh, using special systems, and we'll cover those colours tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Mel.